Whether you call it Kveik, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right. While also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. Beer is produced from four primary ingredients, grains, hops, yeast, and of course, water. It's often said that a pint of beer consists of over 90% water, so it makes sense that the quality of the water we use to brew with is something that brewers would view as being rather important. However, for many, water chemistry is convoluted and complicated, leaving many to ignore it altogether. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to discuss our experiences with water chemistry in the time we've been brewing. Yeah, this one, I think we're going to spend a lot of time just trying to make water chemistry as simple as possible, right? And so this isn't going to be like a huge in-depth, you know, detailed analyses of uh, of water and all that, but just a general idea of the, there's kind of like six major minerals. So we'll talk about those, talk about how we use them, how you add them, when you add them, and just try to make this as simple and as easy as possible, but also share our experiences with water chemistry and what we do um, and what we started doing, what we do now and hopefully help everybody out um, to make this subject, which seems challenging, a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, a, just a disclaimer, we are believers in the importance of water chemistry. We are not imploring people out there to go do it, or we're not saying anything about, you know, if you don't mess with your water, you're going to make bad beer. But we do believe that you can improve uh, your beer by paying attention to water. And listen, I totally get it. With terms like sulfate, chloride, residual alkalinity, ratios, and the like, the idea of adjusting one's brewing water can can be quite daunting. It certainly was for me for years. Uh, our hope with this episode is to do a bit of demystification by talking about our experiences in more in more of a practical way and then sharing the approaches that we found work best for us. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up later this month, August of 2021, is Enno Beer Brewer and Advocate, Alex Liberati of Denver, Colorado. For those who haven't heard of Enno Beer, which is spelled O-E-N-O, B-E-E-R. It's sort of a wine beer hybrid that gets up to 49% of its fermentables from grapes. Very interesting stuff that I've actually had the chance to try a few times. Alex has been featured in publications like Forbes magazine and has a passion for this deliciously unique style. Uh, I'm really excited for this session. If you'd like to be a part of it, you got to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by Friday, August 27th, 2021. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when shopping online. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback for the referral. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who offer brewers beautiful stainless gear, such as the Turnkey BH15 Pilot Brewing System, which has a hard plumb manifold to eliminate all hosing changes during the brew process. Brewers Hardware has a ton of unique purpose-built products useful to both professionals and home brewers. Go see for yourself at brewershardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Joey Lamprecht from Vienna, Austria wrote in saying, after reading your website for about a month, I noticed you have a podcast, which I I now listen to pretty much all the time. Needless to say, I love it. Keep it up. We love you too, Joey. Today, I stumbled upon episode 93, where you talked about reducing cold side oxidation. I know it's been a while, but I still want to throw my hat into the ring. I recently brewed a New England IPA with lots of hops, flaked oats, and barley. I bottle conditioned the beer and used a preservative, which I learned about as a whiskey enthusiast, where oxidation is also a great concern for storage after opening a bottle. It's called Private Preserve and is a can of an inert mix of gases, I believe 
believe mainly CO2 with some nitrogen and argon. I just bottled the beer straight from my fermentation bucket using a bottling wand, added the priming sugar to the bottle, and purged the headspace with the private preserve. Uh, it's been about a month, and as far as I can tell, the beer hasn't oxidized one bit. However, I did leave six bottles without the private preserve and intend to do some triangle tests with them. The only concern I have is that I don't get good head retention in most of my beers. Uh, but for this one, it really sucks. <laughs> I don't know if it has to do with the amount of flaked adjuncts or with the private preserve. I guess the only way to find out is to crack the bottles without it. One downside is that the stuff can be relatively expensive depending on where you buy it, but I reckon one would be sufficient for two to three batches. I thought you might be interested in this, as in the episode you asked if anyone knew of methods for reducing cold side oxidation when bottling. Anyway, joke's on me as I recently purchased a kegging system and do not intend to move back to bottling. Thanks again for the great work on the podcast as well as on your website. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've never heard of that before, um, especially because it's got like argon in it. That's not one of those gases that I normally hear about, um, you know, being in beverages or or um, in beer. Uh, but wow. Uh, I mean, cool. I'm also kind of interested to see how that works, right? Like, how do you get the gas that you just like pour it in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it seems it seems like that that could work. I mean, that could also be a little bit of your head retention issues, right? Because the head retention is just uh, CO two and foam, right? Um, or you know, foam particles. Uh, but yeah, I mean, cool. I mean, that's a pretty cool, cool, um, cool thing. I didn't even realize that they did that as part of distilling. But always, um, always on the lookout for new ways to improve cold side oxidation. Yeah, especially when bottle conditioning. And uh, I, I had a bottle conditioned New England IPA about a month ago. Somebody brought one into the brew. I was hanging out at and uh, yeah, it, it, it was definitely oxidized, at least to my palate. You know, it had that kind of the, the, the hints of turning kind of brownish uh, and that kind of sickly sweet character uh, that I'm just not a fan of. So if you can if you can just, you know, blow some, I guess, uh, private preserve. I've never heard of this stuff. Uh, blow that into the top after bottling. I guess that, uh, that could be pretty helpful. So thanks for the tip there, Joey. Uh, if you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. One of the beautiful things about American Pale Ale, in my opinion, is that it serves as an ideal style for testing out novel hop varieties. It's the reason that we chose it as the style for the Hop Chronicles series. Well, listener Adrian Grisoris from Shivano Park, Texas, did something similar of his own with his The Toot Sweet Pale Ale uh, that he brewed with Southern Star, Medusa, and Sabro Lupomax hops. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. You heard me. You bring in me heart, and now you leave me. Love of my life, can't you see? Bring it back, bring it back. Don't take it away from me, because you don't know what it means to me. That was a gift from me to you. I'm ready to review beers. Ew, yucky. The smell wasn't very pleasing well there's seven feet of head the esters and phenols are fighting a full-on guerrilla war on this one jersey no likey no i don't like it it's not it's not horrible Mm, no it's it's turning horrible it's dish soap it's weird it's weird say dish say say dish soap say dish soap you know what i think it's dish soap it's even the right color it's horrible on the end again too i apologize because i really do feel bad because we're just ham and eggers but we exactly we, we as normal humans can put a beverage in our mouth and decide whether we like it or not and i have decided that as a normal human i do not like this beverage it's getting, it's getting worse yeah. prunes prunes prune juice no nah, it's like kind of like a clove a clove it's, 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 <laughs> that's so crazy it's probably right i'm an idiot i have no idea it's it's, it's weird <laughs> i don't know dude i'm uh, not gonna finish it yeah i'm not gonna finish it either i give it all of zero jerseys yeah yeah negative one for a total 52 so i've heard mixed reviews about the uh south african hops that fairly recently hit the market one of which is southern star and i certainly perceived a unique uh, kind of hop characteristic in Adrian's The Toot Sweet Pale Ale. Uh, I wouldn't say it was necessarily off-putting or bad, but it was unique. It was something new. Um, however, what I did detect were the telltale signs of oxidation, which isn't uncommon for beers bottled from the keg and then put in the mail and shipped. I have a feeling that's probably what it was that threw the guys for a loop on this one. Yeah, it, it stinks that they didn't like it. I mean, sometimes that stuff happens, uh, especially I, I, that's a hop that I haven't had any experience with Southern Star, any of those South African varieties. So I would like to uh, start doing those. Maybe we need to throw those into the Hop Chronicles soon. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that you know, it happens. Sometimes the, sometimes the beer just doesn't make it uh, whenever it's shipped. But damn, Jersey can sing. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Did you like? <laughs> I, he, I, I will tell you this: that that before every review, he sings something, and I try to include little bits of it every once in a while. This time, because it was you know for the audience, I had to include it. Well, thank you so much for sending the beer in, Adrian. In my notes, I also have that there was a slight spicy potentially phenolic thing going on there and I do wonder if that wasn't from the southern star because I didn't it didn't taste to me like a fermentation issue so I I personally feel like it was a well-made beer that probably just suffered uh, from a bit of oxidation due to due to the way that it was bottled and, and shipped so thank you so much for sending that out if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage uh, you feel like sending in reviewed on the show you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we will get you all set up Time for a quick break. When we return, we will be discussing our experiences with brewing water chemistry. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super-efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Water is the most plentiful ingredient in beer, and yet for many gets the least amount of focus. I I presume that this is due to uh, to the whole, if it's good enough to drink, it's good enough to brew with concept, which really is accurate. I mean, I've had some great beers made with unadjusted brewing water, but I've also had some pretty terrible beers where it's obvious the issue is poor water management. Cade, what were your initial thoughts about water chemistry when you first started brewing? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I've said, I've shared a couple of times that I started brewing with a Mr. Beer kit. And so that's just a, a, a you know, little two gallon plastic thing that's kind of shaped like a keg, but it's just a plastic <laughs> brown uh, PET thing, uh, fermentation thing in it. And the instructions for Mr. Beer say fill with water, you know, um, uh, boil half of, uh, you know, use, use your tap water for half of the, uh, to boil the malt extract that comes with it and then just dump it all in there, in there. Uh, so there were no, there was no, talk about you know mash adjustments or like you know I of course you didn't even have to mash so so there was no minerals or acid acidification or pH <laughs> or any of this stuff or phenolics or any of these things that we've all heard about now um, with water chemistry it was just that I mean it was just straight out of my tap um, <laughs> into the beer and again you know those first beers weren't probably the best that I've brewed uh, but I I enjoyed that first beer and I was just so happy to be making beer that that I didn't really give a crap about <laughs> water chemistry. I have a, I have a theory that uh, that the the people who are brewing today who who brewed their first batch 
And the experience was good enough that they brewed a second batch and then they eventually became obsessed like us nerds. My theory is that they, they likely had decent water that they brewed with in the first place. Uh, and that those who were like, screw this, either had a terrible contamination, which we know happens to a lot of people, or really bad water and they and they weren't paying attention to it, which is completely understandable. I, my first batch was an extract with, I didn't even do the Mr. Beer thing. I skipped that whole step and went and did extract with steeping grains. And that first beer came out surprisingly good. I mean, I, I was shocked that it was better than some of the beers I could buy at the store at the time. Now, this was the early 2000s. Uh, and, and in that batch came a little baggie, you know, of gypsum that just said, add this during the boil. And I thought that was water chemistry adjustment. So one of the reasons that I avoided messing around with water chemistry for so long was that I, I presumed that it just wasn't that necessary based on what my first experience was, which was that little baggie that came with my recipe kit. Well, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think everybody has that that first experience like you and I did. But then also, I mean, if you read like Papazian and Palmer's books, so, you know, the 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 complete joy of homebrewing or how to brew. I mean, those oh, th- there are chapters in those books about water chemistry. Let me be clear. But for the most part, the 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 message of those books was like you said at the top of the show, if if you can drink it, you can make beer with it. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and you can make great beer with it. And like you said, I've had uh, several great beers. So there was also this sort of prevailing, uh, you know, mentality that you didn't have to make water or, or water adjustments, or like you said, just drop a handful of, or you know, a little bit of teaspoon maybe of gypsum, yeah, in, into and, the boil. And, I mean, that was where that was where I remember being taught uh, it goes in is is once yeah. you get your wort all, and a part of that is because we're brewing with extract, right? So you're making your wort immediately. Uh, y- you're right though. There, I, in fact, I, I believe it was uh, John Palmer on a, either a podcast or in a, in, a, in one of his uh, books where he said that, you know, if you're brewing decent beer, then water water can be kind of the last thing you focus on. And I, I, I get that argument because it, it does feel convoluted, but it's actually a lot more simple than I think uh, some have made it out to be. And that's our hope with this episode is to kind of simplify this thing a bit so that people out there who maybe are interested in uh, improving their beer. I, I, I use that word uh, hesitantly, but but I do think that if you mind your water chemistry, it, doing so can really take uh, even even tried and true styles that, that you've you know you've been making for a while can really take them to the next level uh, just by mining the minerals and such that you put into your water. What was it ultimately for you, Cade, that that where you said you know what I'm going to start paying more attention to this. I'm going to adjust uh, the chemistry of my water before every batch. Um, I, I don't remember specifically, but all I, but I, what I do remember when I started getting interested in water chemistry was when I started thinking about um, water chemistry as salts, yeah. so spices uh, that you can use to control flavor. That's right, and, yeah. and that's where that's where it first sort of got me interested in it. Uh, you know, I mean, there's also like the off flavor components, right? People talked about like band aid and medicinal flavors that you can have from chlorine and chloramines uh, um, if you're using especially like municipal tap water. Uh, you know that those those can get in there but really for me it was salts and i started thinking about it i was like oh well that makes sense beer is like like we said 90 to 95 percent water so surely it has some sort of flavor component and if i add this gypsum in there or calcium chloride i can actually make my beer taste better right yeah, it's i don't yeah. just when i when i make a steak i i sear the steak but i sear it with salt and pepper on it right i don't just sear the steak flat and then eat it right it would like so we're doing this stuff whenever we're cooking so that's kind of what uh what made sense to me but and that also highlights like why water chemistry is important because it is 90 to 95 percent of beer and it does impact flavor and aroma and other you know organoleptic properties yeah yeah there i I agree with you the 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 argument that uh you know these minerals that we're adding in these salts are are flavoring uh, enhancers flavor enhancers they they are seasonings as it were um that made sense to me but i I, you know i consider myself a a relatively uh persuadable person i'm willing to consider other ideas but for some reason i dug my heels in to the to the mud on this one and and was just convinced that these tiny amounts of minerals that people were adding to their to their beers you know particularly uh all grain uh, during the mash and or, or just adjusting their water prior to mashing that there's no way that would 
would have an impact. And, you know, I had friends who were messing around with water chemistry and I didn't seem to notice their beers, you know, massively improving or anything like that because of it. And, and so what ultimately got me, and this sounds kind of kind of stupid, I guess, but uh, in towards the beginning of the whole brewlosophy experiment thing, uh, a home brewing friend of mine challenged me. He, he was a water chemistry buff and, and swore that it had a perceptible impact. And I disagreed with him. And he said, well, you're, you're the experiment guy. Why don't you put it to the test? And so I did. And that was the very first water chemistry experiment that we did. And it came back. Not only did it come back significant, I could tell the beers apart. And I had a very strong preference for the one that the, the adjusted water. <laughs> so that was that's what did it for me was actual experimentation. Just another example of how, uh, you know, this the, what we call, you know, brewing science can kind of change the minds of us who are doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you haven't done this, one of the easiest experiments that you can do is if you've got gypsum at, at home, if you've got it from the from uh, you know from the homebrew store or whatever, take a beer that you've got a commercial beer or homebrew beer, whatever, right? Um, pour into three cups, uh, take a, like a little pinch of gypsum. And mix it into one, or put it in the bottom of the cups, or you know, mix it into the beer, or either way, add the gypsum first and then mix it. But all you're trying to do is mix the gypsum up in the beer. Then you've got your own little triangle test, and try it for yourself. And I can guarantee you, I've done this a bunch of times, um, where you can actually taste the difference, and you can see, like especially if it's a hoppy beer, like a pale ale or an IPA, that little sprinkle of gypsum in there will really make it sharper and more bitter. But we'll get into, you know, a little bit later, you know, what what these things do. But that's a great experiment if you're not convinced about water chemistry. Um, do that and then and then write in um, and let me know your results. But water is super important and it's really important for us, you know, to think about it as brewers, especially if you're doing all grain. Because water really matters um, at the mash level, um, you know it, it. It's it like you said. It's ninety to ninety five percent of beer, uh, you know, during the and 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 you know during the boil and during fermentation. Uh, you know, there's there are things that you can do to adjust like flavor um, using using minerals. But water at the mash level is where things are really really key. There's enzymatic activity that happens, um, and there's different minerals that apply um, that that cause different reactions to occur uh, that can help your help your beer and your mash move along. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, before we start talking about the impact these different ions and minerals and such have on beer. Perhaps we should talk about source water first, where you actually get the the water that you're going to brew with. I think for, for most people who, at least when they're starting out, obviously the easiest source would be their tap, um, which there are some considerations, I would say, that are that are nearly ne necessary to make uh, if you are going to use tap water. I know so many people who've made the mistake, for example, of uh, just taking that green garden hose and uh, filling up their old brew kettle with <laughs> with water straight out of the green rubbery garden hose, uh, which can leave a uh, beer tasting like a green rubbery garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so that, that, that green watery, uh, water hose has a chemical on the inside of it, uh, that prevents mold and mildew from growing, um, inside of, inside of that water hose. And that chemical can get into your beer and affect it. Um, uh, especially in the mash, as soon as the grain touches that water, that chemical creates, um, the, uh, a medicinal sort of nasty green water hose uh, phenolic. And there's another consideration with your tap water too, which is most of your tap water uh, municipal uh, suppliers treat the water, again, to make sure that there's no bacteria in it, with chlorine or chloramine. I think most most municipal places are using chloramine now, which is different than chlorine. And it doesn't matter. We're not going to get into the differences between those two. All you need to know is that that chemical, chlorine, chlorine or chloramine, if it touches grain, it creates a band-aid or medicinal off flavor. It's awful. Um, if, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it is terrible. If you've yeah. ever had that, you will know it, and, and 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 it's not something you want in your beer. But it's super easy to fix. Yeah, it it cre it creates a chlorophenol, which is like you said, medicinal. And if anybody who's ever there's chloroseptic is a chlorophenol based <laughs> throat soother. Uh, it, you know the flavor, and if you have a beer that has that flavor in it, it is very unpleasant. Um, it, it, I'm not sure what the ratio is uh, in, in terms of, uh, who, you know, what municipalities are using chlorine versus chloramine. I can say that where I live, it's chlorine. Uh, and it thankfully, it's not even strong enough to smell on tap water straight out of the tap. But, but you know, invest in a $30 RV filter 
uh, and pick up a, a, a bag of sodium or potassium metabisulfite and you literally add a just a tiny little amount of this to your water about 10 minutes before you brew. That's what I've been told. Um, I do it and, and it really does seem to work well. Um, I don't get any of that chlorophenol thing going in my beers, but absolutely, like you said, kid, you got to pay attention to what your starting water uh, chemistry is and that includes the disinfectants that, that your municipality is using. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we're talking about water sources, that's the whole point. You have to know what you're starting from, right? If you don't know where you begin, you have no idea where you're going, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> if I don't know how many min- what minerals are in my water, um, I don't I don't know what to add from. Now, that's an important uh, secondary consideration for tap tap water too, right? Tap water is going to have trace minerals in it. It may have some calcium or some sodium in it, um, or or maybe even some magnesium and sulfate. Uh, these these minerals that we'll talk about just in a little bit. Uh, so you want I want to know if you're if you are um, using tap water and you're interested in water chemistry, you want to take a look at your water report and see what chemicals are in there. Now, we're going to talk about the minerals that you need to focus on, and they may not be listed on your water report. Uh, <laughs> but if you can send it off, you can get a water test for relatively cheap. Or um, I've got a the Lamont Brew Lab kit, which I love. It's yeah. fantastic. And it's super fun to like actually um, do some the like, color titrations at home. It's super easy. But uh, so, yeah, but the. the knowing where you're starting from is the whole purpose. And those are some considerations with tap water. Um, again, you can make great beer with just regular tap water. Add a Camden tablet, potassium metabisulfate, or um, uh, sodium metabisulfate to kill off the chloramine and chlorine. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, they, there's going to be trace minerals in there, and those minerals might be good enough uh, to make great beer. Yeah, and without question, uh, the biggest issues when it comes to water chemistry likely are going to stem from tap water. I mean, you're not you're, if you're going to the store and you're buying water, that that stuff has all all the bad stuff filtered out. So then all you're doing is you're you're paying attention to what type of water, which which we'll get into that here in a second. Uh, and what the mineral makeup of that water is. What's what's cool is that if you go to the website, let's say you go buy Arrowhead water or something, and you want to brew with that, you can go to the Arrowhead website, and it will, for the most part, tell you what their what the uh, water chemistry profile of their water is. So you can plug that into your calculator and go from there. It's really neat. Uh, if you are using tap water, I'm just going to say it again. Buy a filter. I mean, uh, you know, and run water through that filter relatively slowly. That carbon needs to contact uh, the water in order for it to do its work. You can't just blast water through your carbon filter. At least that's what I've been told. Uh, so run it through relatively slowly, and then just add a little pinch of some Campton or potassium metabisulfite, and you should be fine. Um, that that the other option, and one that I think a lot of people are doing a lot more today than it seemed like they were doing ten years ago, at least by my observation, is going to the store and purchasing water to use specifically for brewing. One of those uh, one of the types of water that you can buy when you go to the store is spring water. Um, I believe that's what they call it. And that would be some, you know, oh, we got this from, you know, Arrowhead Spring or whatever it is. And uh, again, those ones are going to have a relatively consistent uh, profile, at least uh, that's been my experience experience with those. Yeah, relatively consistent profile, and they'll have some trace minerals in there. It's not going to be as minerally as your tap water, although, I mean, I guess it can be, depending on where you're getting it sourced from, Uh, but there are going to be trace minerals in it. So that's the difference between spring water and, for example, like distilled water. So distilled water is evaporated and condensed, right? So it's got all of those impurities, got all of the, um, you know, sodium uh, bicarbonate hardness, you know, residual hardness in there, all of the minerals and things that are otherwise in water, um, it, it, it's got all of that taken out of it. So spring and distilled are the two that most people can purchase from the store. Um, distilled is basically nothing. All right, yeah. distilled is zero across the board. It is just pure H two O. There are no no residual uh, minerals in it, and that is not. Um, useful for brewing, especially if you're in the mash, because you need some of these minerals in order to for, to have the um, reactions take place with the malt. Now, there's going to be a little bit on the malt, uh, but there's generally not enough just in distilled water um, to be able to 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 mash um, and and do what you need to do during the mash. So that's that consideration. And spring water will contain a little bit of uh, trace minerals in it. But again, like Marshall said, just pull that off the website, and you should be fairly confident there. 
there to know what you're starting with. Yeah, and and distilled water and RO often get kind of used interchangeably. They are very different. Uh, reverse osmosis water is water that's been run through a very, very fine filter, as it were, uh, as well as more. It's actually a, a graded down filtration system. And it, it is close to nothing, but there are still some very, very small amounts of trace minerals in there. Uh, if you look at a, um, a meter to test just these total solids, uh, total dissolved solids in RO water, I mean, I, I had a, there was a period where at my house, they switched the source of my water from our normal groundwater plant to this treatment plant, you know, a couple miles south because they were doing some work on it. And I went from about uh, 60 ppm of TDS in my standard water all the way up to over 300 TDS, which is, that just means there's a lot more junk in there that I, I wanted to make sure for controllability's sake, right? To get that out of there. And so I bought an RO uh, filter online. You can get them for about a hundred bucks on Amazon. Um, and I started running water through that. And lo and behold, I mean, that, that water at the end of the filtration cycle, which it takes quite a while with an RO filter because you are running it through this very, very fine membrane, uh, was down to 2 ppm of TDS. So it, it, it stripped 300 plus you know, ppm TDS water all the way down to two, uh, 2 ppm, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing with RO and if you get a carbon filter for using tap water, uh, remember that those things can go, they, they, they can get filled up, <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> with, with gunk. Uh, so you do need to replace those somewhat regularly as well or replace the membranes in an RO filter or just, you know, depending on your carbon um, filter, you may just throw away the whole filter um, or, or, or replace uh, at least the interior parts of it. But yeah. that's something to, to, to be a considerate of as well. Yeah, exactly. So the, the main point that we're making here, tap water, you need to mind a, a quite a few more things if you're going to use your tap water. Again, you, you can take care of most issues from home unless your tap water is just abysmal. Uh, spring water will usually have a, a you know, it, it might have a perfect profile for certain styles um, and that's fine. Uh, but I've made some really good beers with just store-bought spring water unadjusted because I, I wanted to test it out and came out perfectly fine. Uh, RO and distilled water, you're going to have to, I mean, you don't have to, but you really, is, <laughs> you're going to do a lot better uh, with with uh, getting coaxing out certain characteristics of your beer if you also in terms of mash uh, efficiency and stuff uh, if you adjust the profile of that water so we just wanted to focus a little bit on some of those water sources let's get into the most common uh, minerals and such that we use for brewing and how they impact beer yeah and, and so I really just from a high level perspective there are six. Okay, that we usually focus on, and you'll see those on all the brewlosophy webs or on all the brewlosophy recipes. So any experiment, the water profile for these six things um, will be listed. So that's there's uh, uh, calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfate, chloride, and bicarbonate. Don't worry if you don't remember those. We're going to go into each of them individually. <laughs> and, and just a, a little correction: we actually only list calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfate, and chloride, because bicarbonate is kind of a weird one that yes, it may have an impact, but it is that number, the bicarbonate number is generally affected by your, your addition of the other stuff. And so I don't see it as being necessary to include. So, so if you're looking for our bicarbonate, you can always ask the brewer, uh, you know, the brewlosophy brewer for that number, but I, I'm not sure it necessarily matters as much as the other ones. Oh yeah, cool, and and we'll talk about bicarbonate and what what that does. Bicarbonate's really more of um, an indication of pH yeah. uh, or related to pH. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. But uh, but uh, so these the the first thing, just from a high level, like sort of sciency perspective, um, there these these minerals or these things, um, calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfate, chloride, bicarbonate. These are ions, and what an ion is is just a charged particle. OK, it's got some sort of charge to it. So there's cations, which are positively charged and anions, which are negatively charged. And it breaks down really nicely. There's three and three, three cations, positively charged, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and three anions, which are negatively charged, sulfate, chloride and bicarbonate. And essentially what that means, all that means is, is that these the positive ones will attach to negatively charged particles in beer. And the negative ones will charge will attach to positively charged particles in beer. And there's a bunch of different reactions that that happen um, in brewing. But the 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 reason I bring up ions is also is because 
they they matter in terms of what reaction takes place in the beer, but it also matters in how you add the ion to the beer. So yeah. generally, these um, these things like you're not going to be able to go buy pure sulfate. Well, mo- <laughs> I mean, some people might be able to, yeah. um, but most people are not going to be able to go buy pure sulfate. So when you buy sulfate, you're going to buy it as gypsum, yeah. which is calcium sulfate. So remember, positive calcium attached to negative sulfate, and it creates this powdery substance. Right? right. So gypsum. So but when you add gypsum to it, you're adding both calcium and sulfate. Same thing with calcium chloride and Epsom salt, like you mentioned earlier, magnesium sulfate. So that's the reason I bring up ions. Right. So so that you understand when you're adding these things to it, you're not just adding chloride or sulfate or magnesium <laughs> or calcium. You're adding a combination of the two. Yeah. You're adding a compound. And, and, and this is it's you would be surprised how many people have emailed me over the years because I quite a few years ago, I put out this whole primer on brewing water chemistry, which is basically what we're talking about in this episode now, really just trying to, to dumb it down to the point that, that makes it more approachable to people. I, I can't tell you how many people uh, emailed me and they were like, well, I cannot find sulfate anywhere. You know, where do I find sulfate? I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's gypsum. You're not going to find a, a lot of these. Uh, magnesium, for example, is, is very dangerous <laughs> on its own, you know, in its elemental form. So you, you get it in a compound. It's completely inert and fine. Uh, and that's Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate. Again, you're, you're adding both magnesium and sulfate. Now, with all of these, the, the five main ones plus bicarbonate, uh, in, in your additions, like you, like you mentioned there, Cade, I think it's important to remember that when you are adding, okay, I, I want to, you know, I'm making an IPA. I want to have higher sulfate because that's what you're supposed to do with American IPA. At least it used to be what you're supposed to do. You're also increasing the calcium. So with a lot of these, you're paying attention to both of those. It's one of the reasons, and we'll get to talking about calculators and such later, uh, but it's one of the reasons that using a water chemistry calculator is so helpful because then you're not keeping track of it on your own. Yeah, exactly. And and we'll talk about that in the next segment, right? All of the, how we add these these uh, minerals and, and and salts and how we manage our water chemistry, um, you know, from a practical level, calculators and additions and things like that. Uh, but uh, so the, the minerals themselves, uh, to understand, you know, why you need to add them, I think is also really important. OK, so let's yeah. start with calcium. So calcium does a bunch of things. Uh, calcium is a cat ion um, and it's it it does a lot of stuff so it, it helps improve clarity um, it helps improve like flavor um, it allows it provides a situs like an actual site for enzymatic reactions to happen um, it, so it promotes enzyme activity during the mash and it actually increases foam stability <laughs> and so calcium is a really big one um, that, that that brewers talk about all the time you want to have at least 50 parts per million of calcium in your beer uh so that you have an effective mash. Yeah. Um, if you don't have enough calcium in your beer, your mash efficiency is really going to suffer. And when I say really going to suffer, I mean, if you brew a beer with distilled or RO, which I have uh, with distilled water, uh, my conversion was less than 50%. So maybe in like the, the 40s, just because there's not enough um, uh, of the minerals that are required for enzymatic activity during the mash. Yeah, absolutely. And and calcium, again, I am by no means a water chemistry expert. I just have used, uh, you know... I- I've been adjusting my water chemistry for brewing for years now, and so I, I have some practical knowledge of it. My understanding, though, is that calcium levels also impact fermentability uh, and, and is, it serves as sort of like a yeast nutrient. Uh, it, it, perhaps mm-hmm. that's not mm-hmm. the best term for it, but... No, yeah, that's a great great term for it because the yeast is also going to use that too. And and here, you know, here's another thing. I guess we should probably should have talked about too the reasons why you you would you would add water or add these things. But yeah, some of these minerals are also yeast nutrients. They're not just for enzymatic activity, not just during the mash, but they're also to help help yeast. Um, you know, for example, magnesium. Uh, magnesium is one that that uh, that yeast will use uh, during fermentation. But magnesium also drives uh, the Maillard reaction, which is the browning uh, that happens during the boil, the color change in beer. Um, And and so having magnesium in your water. So for example, if I were just to dump a whole bunch of Epsom salt, right, I'm thinking, oh, it's got sulfate in it. I want to get a really bitter beer. Um, Adding that magnesium is also going to change the color uh, in in my beer, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting way to think about some of these things. So if I add extra magnesium, the beer is going to get darker. I'm going to turn up with 
with a copper or maybe a red IPA, which may be exactly what I want. But that may be a, a, a reason why I would add magnesium sulfate versus calcium sulfate, right? I might want that color change um, uh, or I might need some magnesium. Now, magnesium is one of those trace minerals you don't need a lot of. Uh, like, like, like less than 10 parts per million is really all you need. It really just is not one that, that you need a whole lot of. So be careful with that one as well. I'm not sure what the uh, what the ceiling is on magnesium usage, but uh, remember that that primarily, if you are adding magnesium to your mash or to your brewing water, you're usually getting that from Epsom salt. Google what other things Epsom salt are used for, and you'll and you'll understand why you don't want to use too much magnesium in your uh, magnesium sulfate Epsom in your brewing water. It, it can it can have uh, issues with your gastrointestinal tract. We'll put it that way. Uh, but but yes, you can again. It's a, it's a it's absolutely valid way to get more sulfate uh, into your brewing water while also increasing magnesium and and keeping your calcium at a specific level uh, so that you're not you're not adding too much more calcium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then another one sort of like calcium and magnesium. I mean, again, these are these are the three cations is sodium. Um, it also provides ascitis, right? It also allows, um, you know, uh, things to bind together and remove uh, it. it uh, sodium will bind things together and precipitate. So things will get removed out of solution. So like bad chemicals and flavors will attach to sodium and then precipitate out. That also happened with calcium and some of the other cations as well. Uh, but sodium also uh, is is the the the, the you know table salt is sodium chloride right um, so it does have a minerally flavor to it as well and so if you're adding or if you've got a lot of sodium in your in your tap water that's something you want to be considerate of sodium has a fairly high flavor threshold of around 50 to 100 parts per million before you really start to notice it but if your beer is tasting minerally or dry or you're getting this like you know plaque on your teeth you know or like dryness on your teeth um, whenever you're drinking you may want to look at your sodium concentration and this is one that is easy to pull out with a uh, a good filter yeah. as well so yeah sodium is an interesting one I, it's I, understandably you know we've all g accidentally gulped in uh, seawater you know when we're out swimming in the ocean uh, it doesn't taste good and so it, they're at least in my experience people kind of shied away from using t you know sodium chloride or table salt in their in their brewing maybe adding just a little bit but they didn't you know they didn't view it as being a a, a really good source of chloride uh, we've done some experiments that See, don't necessarily call that into question, but kind of show that you can get away with using quite a bit of sodium without it negatively impacting the character of your beer. In fact, it could have, I mean, we use quite a bit of salt in our cooking and it doesn't necessarily make the food taste salty if you use it right, right? It, it just enhances the flavor. So I, I think it's something that more people should consider uh, when, they're, when they're messing with their brewing water. Now to talk a little bit about some of the anions. Uh, this, is, this is, to me, these are the ones that... Uh, tend to get more focus uh, in, in terms of brewing water in general. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the two that you hear about the most often are sulfate and chloride. Um, you, if you've looked into water chemistry um, or you've started dipping your toes in water chemistry, this is probably where you started, right? And and it's because sulfate, um, it, like you said, it's this anion, um, and it increases the crisp, hoppy bitterness um, of the beer. So um, when you're doing an IPA, for example, um, it, it, historically, Burton on Trent, right, uh, or or Burtonizing your water is something that people might have heard of uh, that was really popular about 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, it was to make your beer, your, your water look like Burton on Trent, which was famous for IPAs. And Burton on Trent, turns out, has a lot of sulfate. And that's what created or what helped uh, the IPA style become what it is. Uh, we, you know, so, so sulfate, if you're trying to increase hop bitterness or you're trying to get this nice, crisp hop flavor, adding sulfate to your beer is really really useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, we've done experiments on this one. Uh, Higher sulfate absolutely has an impact on the way, we'll just say the perceptible characteristics of beer, but in my personal experience, it really does, one, accentuate um, the hop character overall, and that's a tough one to, to talk about because I know a lot of people are brewing New England IPA with really high chloride, so that does as well, but different aspects of it, but it does so, in my experience, by sharpening up those flavors um, uh, as opposed to rounding them out, but then it also has this impact on the perceived both bitterness and, in my opinion, uh, dryness of a beer. So a lot of people have this idea that mash temperature is, is what you, that's what you adjust for the uh, perceptibility of dryness or sweetness in a beer. We have not been able to, to, to make that 
to, to support that idea with our mash temperature experiments. However, you add some sulfate and absolutely, uh, in my experience at least, those beers with the higher sulfate tend to have this perceptible dryness on the palate uh, as opposed to beers made with higher chloride. Yeah, that's exactly my experience as well. And I love that you say as opposed to chloride, right? Because chloride is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. It makes it fuller and sweeter. Um, now, that's not necessarily uh, that's not necessarily like round and thick, right? And it's not like it's not necessarily um, a mouthfeel uh, component, right? It's not going to change the body of the beer, but it is going to make it like fuller, rounder, and sweeter, which is really nice in some of those malty beers and uh, in those New England IPAs where you're trying to get that juicy flavor out of yeah. it, right? To really ni- make that round sweetness instead of like a sharp, biting uh, crispness. Uh, so I think that's why one of the reasons why um, with New England IPA style that chloride has become a lot more popular and one of the things that we'll talk about in the next segment too is addition of sulfate and chloride because there's a little thing called sulfite the sulfate chloride ratio that can really be a helpful tool um, if you're adding if you're looking at adding these two Uh, but for now just wanted to talk about the contributions that they add uh, to the beer yeah and again with both of these if you're adding gypsum that's that's sulfate uh, uh, calcium sulfate or if you're adding calcium chloride you're also increasing your calcium calcium uh, content as well in your brewing water. It very easily, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to mind that when you're using a good calculator. So it's not something you necessarily have to worry about. When it comes to calcium, I've heard that, yes, minimum 50 ppm, that's where you want to be. But you can get all the way up to about, what, 300 ppm or so of calcium without really having a detriment on the beer? Yeah, yeah. I think it's around 300 parts per million or 250. Um, I think it's what I've heard, 250, 300. That's yeah. whenever you'll start really getting a minerally flavor as well. Um, in the beer, so yeah, you 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 should be well um, well able to add a good amount of sulfate and chloride uh, before you get up to that level with calcium. Yeah, and one one thing that I've experienced with chloride, I when I was just getting into you know kind of dabbling in water chemistry after that one experiment, um, I was doing what you suggested earlier, Cade, and pulling off you know beers off the tap, and then I would just add little amounts of of uh, gypsum or calcium chloride, and it's really easy with calcium chloride because they're these tiny little balls. So if you have like a taster cup, you can just add one of those little balls you see it dissolve kind of mix it up and then compare it to a beer that you didn't do that to I, I, I'm pretty certain you'll taste a difference and to me in addition to kind of rounding out people used to say like oh if you want malty go with calcium chloride if you want uh, uh, sharp and hoppy go with gypsum I feel like that's a little bit off these days because because you know obviously people are using both to pull out uh, uh, certain characteristics that are more than just those two things in my experience with higher chloride uh, water even in hoppy beers in addition to it kind of rounding out those sharper hop edges which you may or may not want to me I get like this interesting almost warming in my mouth like a warm sensation not alcohol warmth but like like you just bit into a, a a nice you know roll that just came out of the oven type of warming it's kind of odd <laughs> I don't I don't know that I've ever had the warming situation from it, <laughs> I might but. be alone in that yeah and it might be a mental thing I, I, it might be that it is accentuating the malt and I just kind of connect those two right yeah, I mean, I think you know the fuller and sweetness that that that's probably going to trigger some things in my brain with malt. Um, but again, I like I like what you said. It's not necessarily just about malt and hop, right? It's not sulfate hop chloride malt. It's um, sulfate sharp chloride round. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the best uh, way to look at it. Yeah, that's that's how I like to th- think about it. And then the last one um, that we wanted to talk about is is bicarbonate. And um, bicarbonate is really just a, a like a a, um, a measure of alkalinity. Alkalinity matters it, for your pH. Um, if you believe that pH matters, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. But but you know we we talk a lot about the ideal pH range. Um, that the especially like in the mash that five point two to five point six, which is the ideal range for the amylase conversion of starch to sugar. Uh, So if you have really high bicarbonate, um, your water is really highly alkaline um, and it's going to have a high pH, uh, which is going to make your malt um, during the mash at a higher pH than what is considered uh, ideal. Uh, And then so that's kind of your measure for bicarbonate is the the pH. So this one is where acidification becomes necessary or um, using roasted grains or darker grains that are going to lower your pH uh, when you add them. But we'll talk about like uh, the adjustment of pH in sort of the next segment. 
Um, so, but yeah, bicarbonate's an interesting one because what I've found is, it, I mean, you, you can easily adjust the bicarbonate level by using something like baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate. Uh, but, I, but I find most people aren't doing that these days. And I, and I feel like it's in part because you, the, 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 the biggest concerns that, that at least that I've found that people seem to have is too high of bicarbonate, which can be very easily adjusted by adding either, you know, roasted malt or uh, acid, you know, various acids, which let's Let's talk a little bit about acidification and, and alkalinity in, in, in brewing water. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to be talked about as much these days as it used to be a few years ago, at least in, in my observation. But pH is something that a lot of brewers pay very close attention to. And my understanding is, it, is that it's not necessarily for um, perceptible flavor stuff, but it really has more to do with like mash and conversion efficiency. Yeah, well, I, I mean, there is a lot of um, uh, study about pH and, and mouthfeel. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that talks about that. So the, the finished beer pH is usually around 4.2 or so. Um, so adding dry hops to beer can raise your pH um, or, you know, adding some lactic acid and stuff can can um, uh, lower the pH, which can kind of like contribute uh, a, a mouthfeel flavor to it. But for water chemistry purposes, um the, you know the 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 pH where where most people tend to focus, like you said, Marshall is on, is on the mash, right? Yeah, and yeah. and where where we're getting in and, and we're trying to create the ideal conditions for that conversion of starch to sugar, and that's kind of where I I see pH you know playing playing the most role. But again, it matters where your starting water is. So for example, um, whenever I I brewed uh, in Austin. Uh, my water pH was at like nine. Um, uh, so it was really, really high, really high bicarbonate. We had a lot, a lot of uh, minerality in, in the water. Uh, and that caused, uh, you know, me to have to use copious amounts of acid uh, during, uh, during the mash, or at least it, it caused me to do it. Maybe it wasn't necessary, but I did it um, <laughs> to get it into that ideal pH range. Yeah. And that ideal pH range being about 5.2 pH. Um, and, and, and that's, it's that, that's slightly more acidic than it is, uh, than it is basic, uh, not quite neutral, but 5.2, they say is ideal for conversion. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty. We've got past episodes where we talk more about mash pH. Uh, I will say that, that for the most part, the belief is that if you're within that 5.2 to 5.6 range, that's where you want to be. And that the most common ways people adjust their mash pH, which again, use a good calculator and plug all your grains in and, and it'll spit out a estimate for where your pH will likely be with and without uh, acid adjustment, uh, uh, acid adjustments. And, and then it'll tell you, you could pick what you're going to use lactic acid or phosphoric acid or even citric acid or whatever else to, to adjust that pH down. Um, I do believe that for the most part, for most people, uh, it is adjustments downward uh, that most people are doing. If you have more of an acidic water or a, or a lower mash pH, and um, then you, you might have to add something like pickling lime uh, to bring that alkalinity up to that range if that is something you're concerned about. Yeah, that was a good one to bring up, pickling lime. That's another one of those that's not really um, used that often. But yeah, if you're using a lot of dark grains, especially like in a stout or something, and your water is fairly neutral, you may drop below uh, that 5.2 level. So yeah, pickling lime or uh, baking soda is another good one um, to add and to raise. Like again, baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, right? right. So if you're raising your pH, um, uh, making it more alkaline, really good stuff to add there. Yeah, and you know, chalk used to get talked about a lot, um, and and I feel like people have moved away from using chalk uh, because it does it's it's difficult to dissolve. Uh, it, it it doesn't dissolve readily in uh, brewing water or even in the mash, and so people have started using other sources to to you know uh, increase their alkalinity uh, when needed. And uh, you know the the only the only thing I'll say about using uh, baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, is that you are also adding sodium, and so if you have to add a lot, if you need to increase that alkalinity a lot, which you you shouldn't have to uh, because, uh, you know, grains are a good buffer for this stuff. Uh, just be, be mindful of how much sodium you're adding as well, because that may have an impact on the flavor of your beer. Well, we have spent this last segment talking primarily kind of an overview about water chemistry stuff. We haven't given too much of our opinions or, or shared too much of our experience. When we come back from this break, that's exactly what we're going to be going to do, going into the various approaches we use to adjust our brewing water.
The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classic slight cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear. Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to Grainfather.com, that's Grainfather.com, and get started today. After performing that experiment I talked about earlier that proved to me that even relatively small mineral additions to brewing water can have a perceptible impact on beer, I became a diehard believer that water chemistry matters and began adjusting the water for every batch that I brew. No doubt, it was pretty overwhelming at first, largely because there just seemed to be so many moving parts. It was actually this that inspired a bunch of our uh, subsequent water chemistry experiments, the results of which I am absolutely not ashamed to admit have influenced my current approach to brewing water adjustment. Now, going way back to my very first extract batch, it came, I, I mentioned this earlier, it came with that little baggie of white powder that I learned was gypsum, uh, and the instructions simply said to add it to the wort as it was heating to a boil, easy peasy, and to this day, I hear from people who continue to use this very simple approach. Now, now I don't use that approach anymore. I adjust my brewing water and, and go from there. I no longer worry about, I just want to get this out there. I'm one of those few people who no longer worry about adjusting the pH of my brewing water uh, because of two experiments that we've done. We've talked about them in past episodes where we, we, we adjusted our brewing water down very, very low, uh, low pH using acid. And then we did another one. In fact, I brewed this experiment where I used pickling lime to adjust it very, very high and the beers were imperceptible. Yes, there was a small impact on, uh, you know, during the mash on conversion, but it wasn't big enough for me to care. And what I found, at least using the water that I use, is that my mash pH, the lowest, even if I'm making a, you know, a super dark stout of some sort, my mash pH is still usually around 5.0, which I'm not too concerned with. And then in the palest lagers that I make, I've never been over 5.4, 5.5. So I'm, I don't worry myself with that. I just want to get that out there because I'm not going to be focusing on, on pH in this next segment when we're talking about our experiences with uh, brewing water. 
Yeah, I, I probably will a little bit uh, just because of brewing with tap water there in Austin with it being so high. I mean, my, yeah. my pH was like up in the sixes uh, sometimes, in you know, during the mash, which I felt like was just too high. I never actually participated in one of the uh, uh, pH experiments through philosophy. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's one of those things that uh, maybe I should have while I was there uh, during COVID. Uh, maybe we should have done done one of those. But but I, I, I have focused on pH. But we'll, so I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, acidification and acidifying um, if you need to do that, just <laughs> since that's sort of tangentially related yeah. uh, to water chemistry. Absolutely. And again, you have to know your source water profile. And, and I know mine. Uh, it's I, I'm lucky enough to have relatively low minerality in the water that I get to my house 95% of the year. Uh, and so that, that it makes it so that I don't have to worry about it nearly as much. If I was brewing with super hard water or high bicarbonate water, then yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a different approach. But for me, I'm not concerned about it. And that's a me thing. I'm not suggesting other people out there don't need to be concerned about it. Now, what I'd like to do uh, it, first off is start talking about the different ways uh, people adjust their water. Uh, when, back when I was brewing, when I first started getting into water chemistry stuff and focusing on that piece of things, uh, I was doing your standard batch sparge using a converted cooler, right? Uh, and so what that meant was that I had two volumes of water. I had my, my mash or strike water, and then I had my sparge water. I, I'll never forget hitting the forums and like, what do I do? How do I calculate the, the minerality to make both of these the same? And somebody commented, in fact, it was, I believe it was a fairly well-known person in homebrewing commented and said, All, you, you really only have to adjust your mash water because that's what matters, right? That's, it, it's that water with your grains for the 60 minutes. That's where you're going to need the impact of, uh, you know, of the, of the, of the minerals for your, for your conversion and such, uh, with your sparge water, you just want to make sure the pH doesn't get too low, right? Uh, too low or too high. And so, so I, I, since knowing my water, I didn't even adjust my sparge water. I just filtered it. And then I, I, you know, I do my batch sparge. Have you heard of that approach where you just, uh, adjust the, uh, the minerality of your, of your, uh, mash water? Oh, definitely, definitely, and that's that's how I would say I did my mash adjustments for mm, probably the first four or five years that I was brewing. Um, I I only did adjustments to my mash and not to my sparge water, um, and that was whenever I was fly sparging um, and everything. You know, I I just I just um, I I think I saw those comments. I saw those people um, saying those things, and I was doing. I did a little bit of research into it. Um, like we said, the primary uh, one of the primary purposes of adjusting your water is to make the mash uh, to to give the the right requisite minerals uh, during the mash and right. so it is kind of it does make a lot of sense that if we need all of these minerals at this time during the mash uh why you know why am i adjusting my sparge water or what you know what do i why should i have to do anything to my sparge water i'm just rinsing at that point right so why do i need to add and make sure that i've also controlled the minerals and stuff in there now ph because of tannins and astringency and extracting um you know tannins out of the husk material and things like that i think we've done some um, other um well, maybe we haven't. I mean, I, I think we have done some other podcasts where we've talked about astringency and and mine and, and Marshall's opinions on <laughs> on astringency, uh, namely that I don't think you can make your beer more astringent by using high pH beer uh, <laughs> or high pH sparge water. But uh, you know, th those are the things that that whenever I started brewing, at least for the first several years, I was only doing my mash water, my mash, and that would include the acidification, right? So I'd sparge with nine uh, pH nine water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally not recommended, right? But but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, not it recommended at all. Yeah, <laughs> it does seem really difficult uh, to extract those tannins, at least using the techniques that we as homebrewers have uh, readily available to us. Now, my issue, I, I brewed a number of batches using this, you know, approach where you just adjust the uh, the the, spar the smash water, and and back then I was adjusting pH and all of that stuff as well, uh, and, and the beers came out good. I felt like the you know the the adjustments that I was making were having a perceptible impact. And in my head, they were positive. Um, but, you know, I'm two years into this going, wait a minute. It, we know for a fact that what the, that these minerals, these ions that we're hoping to contribute to the water uh, uh, and to, in order to impact flavor, we know that they're having some sort of a per perceptible impact because we've tested it. Why w wouldn't it matter that the sparge water doesn't have those minerals. I would think, right, this sounds so hokey nowadays, but back then I was like, wait a minute, that 
you would want all of that water to be consistent if, if that, those minerals are having a positive impact regardless. Because even if I'm just at topping up my kettle with that water, I still want that water to have those minerals in it. And so what I started to do, and this was one of the more annoying phases of my brewing water career here, was uh, I, I would, back then I was using Martin Brungard's uh, brewing water spreadsheet which is very helpful. And he actually broke it down. There's a mash column and a sparge water column and you just put your different volumes. And so I was measuring out two separate, uh, you know, mineral additions for each, my mash and my sparge, just to try to get them to be the same. Uh, and I know a lot of people to this day who continue using that method because they do want that minerality uh, to be consistent throughout all of their brewing water. Um, and, and if you're splitting up your, your brewing water volumes because, you know, you're doing a, 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 a mash and a sparge step, then that's, a, that's another very valid way to do it while ensuring that consistency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and, and that'll segue a little bit in, in a minute into uh, the different mash, ca- or I'm sorry, those those water calculators, water addition calculators that are out there, because I think that's re- that is really uh, important. But and that's how I got started uh, in looking at a, a sparge ca- or in in water chemistry calculators yeah. is trying to figure out how much of what mineral is supposed to go in the mash water versus the sparge water. And at some point I just said, look, this is this is this is dumb. Why am I doing this? Like I'm measuring out, you know, down to like, you know, 0.1 or 0.2 grams or 0.0 something grams. um, And I'm putting this in the mash and then I'm remeasuring to go into the sparge. Why don't I just do it all at once? Can I just collect all of my water and then adjust it all and then I'm done, right? And then I don't have to worry about it. Yes, and that is that is what I think a lot of us are doing nowadays, particularly as the rise of, uh, you know, no sparge or or full volume mashing methods has has continued to get more popular. Right, uh, it's just easier. You're collecting your entire volume of water, you adjust it once, and you're done. It's beautiful. Now, I will say that these approaches, where you're the 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 uh, the concept at least of adjusting the entire volume of brewing water, whether you're splitting it up or not, I feel like there that that uh, uh, you know, it recognizes the impact that, uh, these adjustments can have on flavor, uh, at more than just, you know, the, the, whatever is going on during the mash, all of the reactions that occur there. Yes, it's important, whatever. But for me, I want that gypsum in there. I want that higher sulfate because I want a crisper, you know, IPA in the end. I'm not necessarily concerned about, you know, getting a, an extra half a point of efficiency, half percentage point of per- efficiency out of the mash. I'm a home brewer. That doesn't bother me as much. I want to make sure that beer tastes good. And to me, that was my big focus. So I've, I've really appreciated the move toward, uh, you know, um, adjusting my entire volume of brewing water. Yeah, me too. And that's entirely what I do now um, is adjust my entire brewing brewing water. So I'll just collect all the water and then um, and then put it in there. Now, the, the, the big downside for that is, is that it, you do have to have a large enough vessel yeah. to collect the full amount of brewing water. So if you're if you're in an apartment or inside, you know, brewing on a on a stove uh, inside your house, you're probably not going to be able to collect 15 gallons of water yeah. um, and, and treat all that at the same time. So you may be limited a little bit by your equipment and and that's where you know things like uh, uh, water chemistry calculators really, really come in handy. Um, yeah, and and one little a little tip that uh, I got from somebody a while back when I was you know I was just talking with them about how to go about adjusting consistently adjusting your entire brewing water volume when you don't have a vessel that's large enough for it. Now you know just just to be fair here. If you're doing brew in a bag, you're already doing full volume brewing, so your kettle is is where you're going to make those adjustments, and it should fit. I mean, I, I've got a, I believe the SS Brewtech One V that I'm brewing on now. I do full volume brew in a bag. I, I think it's about ten and a half or eleven gallons total, and I've yet to have an issue brewing up to ten sixty five OG beers. Uh, you know, getting the full volume of brewing water into that kettle prior to mashing in, uh, dropping the bag of grains in. So, so I I don't think it's a huge issue for most people, but Let's say you are one of those folks who doesn't have the vessel space. One thing that you can do, this was a little tip that uh, I got from another home brewer, is if you have a couple of brewing buckets, you, you fill one up with five gallons of however much brewing water that you need, you make all of your adjustments to that, and then you get your other set of brewing water, maybe in another bucket or in your kettle, and you just kind of pour them back and forth a little bit. Now, the low oxygen folks aren't gonna be happy with that recommendation, understandably, but that will, that will homogenize the minerality of both of those sets of water. And I, I don't know, if that's something that you're concerned with, I think it's a fairly valid approach for making sure that, that your, uh, your water chemistry is consistent, at least across two volumes. 
Yeah, exactly. You want to make sure that your water chemistry is consistent if you're if you are doing that, um, uh, you know, and and, you know, I mean, I guess I say that you want to make sure I think you're going to be fine, too. Right. If you just do your mash and and just add all of your minerals to your mash, like, like I said, that's something I was doing very successfully for sure. a long time. Um, you know, so so you don't have to mix it all at once, although I do agree with Marshall. I think that you have a benefit there that the flavor uh, impact for the minerals and, and access and you're not you're not leaving the minerals stuck in a grain bed or something you know i mean they're all sort of mixed in with the water um and 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 it's all there right yeah. it's all together doing its thing um i think that's just I, to me it just sounds more useful um more more beneficial yeah and and you make a good point i i i you know lest we forget about our past my the first few batches where i actually at, did all of these measured adjustments uh you know i that, that's what i that's what i did is i i collected my regular water i mashed in and then i added all of my minerals. The the reason I stopped doing that one is it, it always felt a little bit more hectic, <laughs> you know, getting the mash and then trying to measure out all my minerals and getting them added in and then stirring the mash again. And somebody said, well, it's, this is water chemistry adjustment, not mash chemistry adjustment. What you should just mineralize your water and then you're done. You're set. Made a lot of sense to me. That's the approach I use now. I always adjust my water prior to mashing in. Uh, and I, and I, again, I'm having uh, positive, positive results doing that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm in I'm in the Utebrow, um, you know, uh, the 110 volt systems. So like you, I'm, I guess I'm brewing a basket instead of brewing a bag. Right. Um, but but yeah, so I'm adjusting my full full volumes of water. But that raises a really, uh, you know, g- smart question, right? How much do we add <laughs> of, of these minerals? How do I figure that out? Like, okay, I understand I need calcium, I need sulfate, I need chloride, but how much and 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 how do I add that? And this is where um, if, if, if this is where water chemistry, I think most people go, yeah, no, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not screwing around with it. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Um, uh. it, yeah. Cause it's just, it's just going to be so complicated, but it really doesn't have to be. Okay. Right, right. The easiest way it, to do it, it is exactly like what Marshall and I started doing. And you can make good beer this way is if, if you want sharper beer, add a little bit of gypsum. If you want rounder beer, add a little bit of chlor- of chloride, of yeah. uh, calcium chloride, okay? And that can be as simple a water addition as you want, right? That's easy. Yeah. Um, but if you want to do it and make it, um, you know, tweak your recipe, um, you know, start tweaking the amount of gypsum that you add, you know, to really adjust that sharpness level, uh, that's where you're going to want to have uh, access to some sort of water chemistry calculator. And there's a bunch of them out there and a bunch of them that I've used. Uh, no, maybe not a bunch. There's a handful of them out there i'll say um but they're all good and they're all just they all have their strengths and 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 weaknesses but they're all they're all pretty good i mean beersmith was one i used for a long time um you mentioned martin brungard's uh brewing water spreadsheet uh which i think a lot of people start with i mean brun water brewing water is free yeah um and then you know beersmith uh come you know you have to have the subscription to use the water profile uh, but the one that i've really started using recently um since we've made the switch to brewfather is brewfather's water calculator and i really love that one because that one seems to mix in all of the best of Bruingard, of Beersmith, and uh, you know Brewer's Friend, some of the other water profile uh, calculators that are that are out there. I couldn't agree more with you, Cade. I'm, <laughs> I, I was shocked with how incredibly easy, for one, uh, the Brewfather water chemistry uh, uh, calculator is to use, and the fact that it just calculates the additions based on the recipe that you've already built. You're not plugging in different water volumes or anything like that. I absolutely love it. I, I strongly recommend everyone go check out uh, the, the Brewfather app on, on online. There's a reason we made the switch, and we're all very happy with it. That being said, we're, we are not crapping on other water chemistry calculators. I was so happy happy back when we were using uh, uh, Beersmith uh, when when Brad added the water chemistry calculator there. Very, very helpful. Obviously, I don't know anybody who hasn't dabbled with brewing water and it's so accurate. Martin's one of the smartest people when it comes to water chemistry. You have so many options for you. Um, some are going to be, I think, more easy to understand quicker than others uh, because this stuff can get rather convoluted. In my experience, Brewfather really does do a good job of just making it easy. So check those out if you want to start making water chemistry adjustments. They will be very helpful for you. And one of the keys I'll say with with a, a calculator is there's two things that you need to keep in mind. Where you're going and where you are. Okay? <laughs> yes. So that's that's what you need to you need to sort of define um, with w- when you're using a calculator where you're going and where you are. 
Exactly. You said it before, Cade. You, you got to know where you're starting and then you got to know what your destination is. And what we're going to talk about now are those various destinations. And I think when it comes to making water chemistry adjustments, this is where, if there's going to be any contentiousness, this is where it is at, right? Uh, I, I, it, it's so funny to see the people argue about certain uh, water, you know, water profiles and what you should and should not use. Um, understandably, I think... It, it, one of the more easy ways to get into adjusting uh, water profiles, or at least for determining where that destination is you want to go, is to look at the regions where certain styles that you might be brewing were developed, right? Oh, I want to make an IPA. What was the water profile of Burton-on-Trent? Oh, I want to make a stout. Where do we look for stout water? Oh, Dublin, Ireland, right? Because that's where Guinness is at. Yeah, I want to make a Pilsner or a Czech Pils. Which maybe I should look in in Plzen and in, in uh, you know Czech Republic there, yeah. um, and see what the water was like there. It makes a lot of sense, right? And and if you think about styles themselves, I mean the the styles of beer came to be because of the water. I mean, it's not like you could. It's not like people were importing water or doing like reverse reverse osmosis filtration or <laughs> you know uh, uh, adding Camden tablets and things like that to to control their water profile. I mean, they were just pulling water out of a stream and brewing with it. And so that's how a lot of these styles came to be. And I think that makes a lot of sense about why people sort of set up uh, their their water chemistry through that lens, right? I want to match the water that's in Burton on Trent, or I want to match the water in Dublin or in Cologne, Germany, or, uh, you know, in London or wherever. Right. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's an idealistic approach. I don't think it's a good approach. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with it, Cade? No, absolutely no. not. Nothing wrong with it. And you can make great beer doing it. I was going to say, does it mean that if you uh, if you don't match those water profiles that you're not going to make a proper fill-in-the-blank style? Oh, God. Hell no. Of no. course not. <laughs> and that's the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, this, this was a conversation I believe I had with John Palmer during an event one time uh, where we were just kind of going off on, on, on water chemistry and such. And this idea of, of matching an historical regional water profile, one, I have to believe, and I believe there's, there's evidence of this, that the brewers in some of these classic breweries where these styles were quote unquote invented, uh, they were making water chemistry adjustments as well. So yeah, oh, we've got the water profile of Burton on Trent. That doesn't mean that the IPA being produced in Burton on Trent had these you know 600 ppm sulfate levels or whatever it is uh, necessarily. Uh, those brewers were thoughtful. They wanted to do what made their beer taste taste the best it could as well. And that may have meant that they were making some adjustments uh, to their water profile, which we don't have access to, right? So I think personally, a, uh, a more effective or more thoughtful way of approaching that destination profile that you're going for, what you want to brew beer with, is to Make those adjustments yourself. You can look at various different components, uh, but but one way to do it is to hit the internet and see what people who are brewing beer. Uh, one for me that was really big was when I was making IPA of various colors. In fact, whether that was American IPA or brown IPA or red IPA, was uh, Mike Tasty McDole. You know, rest in peace, Mike. Um, but he had his water profiles published, and when I started matching his water profiles, which you're never going to be spot on, but you can get very close to it, given your starting water. Wow. Did I notice a difference in that poppy hop character in my IPA? Yeah, exactly. You know, so so you you looked at at at, at Mike McDowell, um, who's an incredible brewer, and said, "Hey, I, if I can match his water profiles, maybe I can make good, you know, great beer like him." Right. That's that's a really good way to do it, right? I mean, that's and if you look at uh, you know a Burton on Trent, and you say that's a, a I, that's what I want to match, then go match it, right? But at the end of the day, it matters what it tastes like to right. you. And what we're talking about here is water chemistry adjustments, okay? So you you want to know where you're going. So look at you know um, look at different people and see what they're doing. Uh, Martin Bruingard's Bruin Water spreadsheet, for example, has a whole bunch of water profiles. Yeah. Um, you know that aren't that are regional, but also just yellow. Um, you know, yellow dry, yellow balanced, yellow full. Um, and those tweak the sulfite or sulfate and chloride ratios um, in those beers and the minerality. Um, you know, so you get to play a 
around with those things. Now, I want to mention real quick, you know, I said make sure you know where you're going, but you also know where you are, okay? So to get from where you are to where you're going, there's essentially three things that you can do in any of these calculations. It took me forever to figure this out. I wish somebody had explained this to me. Adjust your grains, adjust the minerals, and the, or adjust acids, Okay, that's going to get you your mineral, your your prof, your water profile where you want it to go. Grains are, for example, like we said earlier, darker grains are going to have acid adjustments to it, right? So that's going to reduce the alkalinity. It's going to reduce uh, the acidity. So you may need to add some sodium bicarbonate, some some baking soda, in order to get to uh, the pH range that you need. Right. Uh, on the well, flip well, side, the roasted gra- darker grains are going to increase your acidity while 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 uh, reducing the alkalinity. Right. It has the same impact that acid additions do on on your uh, on your mash. Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. The, adding the darker grains is going to reduce your pH. So you may have to add uh, baking soda in order to increase your pH uh, to, to, to balance that to balance that out. Uh, but yeah, you know, and, and think about like sulfate, too. For example, if you've got water that's got 600 parts per million sulfate um, and you don't want to brew an IPA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you may need to do something to strip that out. Uh, you know, so again, you, you want to look at those three sort of levers. So your grain bill is important. It it plays a role, your minerals that you're adding, and then the acids that you're adding to, to, to get to that final pH. And so yeah. I think if you have an understanding of those three levels, suddenly those brewing calculators started to make sense to me. Like, oh, okay, that's why they're asking for me to input my grain bill here. Um, and, and then they're asking me to input my minerals that I'm going to do here. And then acid adjustments, uh, in, in this way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, and ultimately, I mean, I, this is kind of an interjection here, but you know, when, when you go and you're scrolling down all of the different water profiles that whether they're in Brewfather or Martin Brungard's uh, brew and water spreadsheet, wherever you're finding those, those are ultimately based on somebody else's opinion, uh, which is informed by their own experience. The best way to determine what you want is to do it, uh, right? To experience it for yourself. If, if whoever it was that determined higher chloride water uh, makes a New England IPA uh, juicy or whatever that is that contributes to that juiciness, if they'd never been experimental in trying that out, we wouldn't. We likely wouldn't have that aspect of juicy IPA that we do today, right? You got to mess around and try these things out. Um, and so I, I'm a big advocate for just try it, see what happens, and you can come up with a water profile if you're looking. And and you know, you're you, that's the beauty of a lot of these calculators. You can go plug in ideas, and then it'll just spit out what what uh, compounds you need to add, right? What salts you need to add to get you uh, to, to to as close to that profile as possible. It's really nice. It's very simple. Obviously, you're going to need a a scale. I like one that that. Measures Measures down to the hundredths uh, because I'm kind of a numbers nerd. Um, but but anyways, experience this stuff. Mess around with it. Have some fun with it. The way that I've settled on <laughs> adjusting my brewing water, and it's weird. I feel like there's this bell curve of complication that I've <laughs> been a part of. Uh, I, I used to do the very precise measurements, and I was looking at every one of those minerals that we talked about earlier. And then we did all these experiments and I started doing some personal experimentation myself on the side. And I have kind of settled on the the two most important ions being sulfate and chloride. And so what I focus on primarily now is sulfate to chloride ratio. It's a very common uh, term that you'll hear kind of thrown around in brewing circles. Um, and what that is, is it's just a ratio of how much sulfate you have and how much chloride you have. And if you get those, if knowing your brewing water, right, knowing where you're starting from, once you get set ratios for specific styles, it's really easy to go back, plug in the ratio that you want into your calculator, make sure that your calcium is above 50 ppm, which almost always will be the case if you're if you're making you know uh, gypsum and calcium chloride additions, and then you just spit out those two. And and the only minerals that I keep on hand anymore are gypsum and calcium chloride. It's very simple. It has a notable impact on the beer that I'm brewing, and it's it, it works. You know. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's exactly what I do too. I, I focused pretty much entirely on those two. I, I keep a little bit of Epsom salt around as well, uh, but Epsom salt, gypsum, and calcium chloride are really the only three minerals that I ever even use or or ever need to use. Even whenever I'm brewing with roasted grains, I don't ever find myself needing baking soda. Although I guess I could just run into the kitchen for that <laughs> if I <laughs> yeah. needed it. Uh, but but yeah, sulfite to chloride, and that's a really easy one to do, right? It, right. So this is a really 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 
simple one to to check. Even if you're just if you're not even you don't even know what your um, what your water tastes like originally, right? Or, or 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 what mineral content you have in your water. If you're using tap water, adding just adjusting those two things, sulfite and chloride, sulfate and chloride, uh, they can really really improve your beer. And it's a super easy thing to do. Just add a handful or add a teaspoon of gypsum in or a teaspoon of cl- calcium chloride. You can even do it at the end um, if you want. You know, add it throughout the process. But this is where you get to try. And if you're looking to dip your toes into water chemistry, that's really, it's a super powerful tool. Once you figure out sulfate to chloride ratios, your beer is going to go, uh, It's in my opinion, it's probably going to get much better uh, because you're, you're going to have tweaked it uh, in a way. You're going to have added those seasonings that make the beer spiced the way that you want it uh, to be. <laughs> and again, this one is the one, this is the jumping off point if you're looking for it, right? If you don't know anything about water chemistry or you're nervous about getting started, um, sulfate to chloride ratio is a very simple place to start. It, not only is it, it's a simple place to start, but it's where I've stuck, you know, and I've done the more complicated adjustments. I'm Again, I'm not encouraging anyone to change their ways or, or, to, or, to, or to not focus on any of the other stuff. In fact, this is one of those areas where I think being kind of a nerd about it for a little while kind of gives you a good idea of what all goes in to water chemistry adjustment. But then, you know, I backed off of that and I've been very pleased with my results just to kind of go over uh, some ways that I think about sulfate to chloride ratio in terms of adjusting my water for certain styles. If I'm making a pale ale or an IPA, I I am the, uh, of the pre- I prefer the crisper old school American IPA. I don't brew much if any uh, hazy IPA these days. So I do like that higher sulfate and I'll do a two and a half up to a three to one ratio of sulfate to chloride, which in terms of amounts is is roughly, you know, 250 to 300 ppm of sulfate to, you know, 100 to 150 or so of chloride. Yes, I want them both in there. You know, they I, I like the impact that both of those being in that in that brewing water add. But because I know that, and I, again, I do this for pale ale, I do it for IPA, I do it for anything that's that's really hoppy. I'll even do it for like, say a German pilsner because I prefer my German pilsner to have a crisp, slightly mineral note to it. And and that's what I get from a higher proportion of sulfate to chloride in that brewing water. If I'm making a bohemian pilsner, one of the defining things to me about a bohemian and Pilsner, or what I believe they're calling a Czech pale lager these days, um, it is that it is a softer mouthfeel. It has a little bit of that thing that I call warming, whatever that is. And so I'll back off and I'll keep that, I'll keep that ratio closer to one to one at also, I only take my calcium up to 50 PPM. So whatever amounts of gypsum and calcium chloride that I need to add to get that 50 ppm of calcium is what I go with when I'm making that style. So it's really simple when I'm approaching it. If I'm making a stout, I don't worry about pH again because I've not had an issue with that in my brewery, but I'm gonna, you know, I like to have a more balanced uh, profile for stout as well, but I'll amplify, I'll bump up the amounts of those to about 100 to 100 ppm sulfate to chloride. It's just the way that I do things and it's a really easy way for me to approach adjusting the water chemistry. Yeah, totally. Same thing. And and if you're looking for like a rounder porter, right? Like if you're making a porter and you want to really round, I might do like a half, uh, a half to one. So half sulfate to chloride. Yeah. Um, you know, like 50 parts per million sulfate, 100 chloride or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a really powerful tool and it's a really, really easy way uh, to, to, to tweak your beer. Um, and yeah, like you said, Marshall, earlier, that's what I've stuck on as well too. This is how I adjust my beers now. I'm not trying to, you know, micro manage the specific or hit a specific number. I'm more just trying to worry about ratio. Yeah. So again, if I've got, if I'm putting 50 parts per million of sulfate in there and I want an IPA, um, or sorry, let me, let me say oh, an IPA where I want two to one. So if I'm doing a uh, hundred parts per million sulfate and 50 parts per million chloride, that's great. Or I could do 400 parts per million sulfate and 200 parts per million chloride, as long as that ratio is the same. Yeah. Now, the last thing I will say about that, because that does bring up a good a good point, is the more minerals you add, at some point, you're going to get to a level where that, where that minerality actually starts to taste like minerals, right? Yeah. It's going to start to taste <laughs> chalky. It's going to start to taste like you're gritty on your teeth and, and, and things like that. So, you know, you don't want to go too high with it, but there you have a whole range of flexibility before you get to those levels. 
Yeah, I was told one time, and I've not brewed a beer where I get this necessarily. Uh, perhaps other people have perceived it in my beers, but but haven't told me. But if you overdo minerals, whatever minerals those may be, that can contribute, like you said, a chalky thing. Or if it's certain minerals, I believe sulfate's one of them, it can start to have kind of like a metallic characteristic to it. So you just got to be mindful of that. Another area, and this is the kind of the last point I'll focus on that I think uh, some people kind of overlook when it comes to adjusting water chemistry is, is body and mouthfeel. Now, I mentioned it earlier. We've done a, a bevy of mash temperature experiments that just fly in the face of common knowledge of, of what we thought we knew about mash temperature and long chain dextrins and sweetness and dryness and such. Uh, what I have found is that certain uh, water chemistry profiles enhance dryness, while other ones seem to enhance body and mouthfeel. If you are making New England IPA and it looks good and everything's everything about the appearance is good, except when you drink it, it feels really thin in your mouth and it doesn't have that. You know, a lot of people prefer or desire this kind of thicker mouthfeel in a New England IPA. It doesn't have that. It's 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 lacking in the body or or the mouthfeel component. Check out your water chemistry. If you bump up that chloride to say two to one or two and a half to one, you may very well uh, uh, create this impression of fullness on the mouth, even though you've done nothing different with your mash or your grain or, or even your hopping rates. It very may very well be that if you just adjust and tweak that water profile a little bit, that you can have the desired impact on mouthfeel as well. And I think that is, it, again, it's slightly overlooked. I don't hear it talked about very often, but in my experience, it's one of the better ways uh, to influence mouthfeel and body in a beer. Yeah, 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 totally. I, I mean, I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that it's going to like change the body, but definitely will change the perception exactly. of the body, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would make it rounder and 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 perceived to be a little bit more fuller um, um, and, and a little bit of sweeter too, uh, which can definitely be useful. But yeah, but I mean, you can see how water chemistry is a really powerful tool and it plays a big role uh, in, in, in brewing and in flavor outcomes, not just in sort of, uh, you know, the enzymatic activity that happens in the mash, but also in flavor and, yeah. and what the beer ultimately tastes like. Uh, so, you know, hopefully the, what we've gone through today with water chemistry is at least enough of a primer that um, if you were nervous about it, you know, you, you're, you're into it, uh, you can get into it. And hopefully uh, people who have played around with water chemistry and we're just looking for, you know, some more experience about like what Marshall and I do. Hopefully there's been a little bit of that as well, too. Yeah. And, and just a, 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 a little simple roundup. Water chemistry is not scary. Uh, once you do it a few times, you'll realize what we mean by that. It's very simple. It can have a very notable impact on your beer. You, you may need to uh, uh, you know, invest in some relatively inexpensive equipment like a scale, which I got on Amazon for $12. Uh, you know, Maybe a filter if you're using tap water. Mind your, uh, the, the disinfectant that your municipal source uh, uses. Make sure that you know what your starting point is and make sure that you determine what your end point is where you want to go with your water profile based on the style that you're brewing. And I think you'll have good results. Well, Kate, I think that pretty much sums up our experiences and thoughts on brewing water chemistry. Any last words before we sign off? No, I think this was a long one, but we covered it. If you have any questions, just don't hesitate to reach out. Always happy to help with this stuff too. Absolutely. And don't forget to check out our new podcast, The Brew Lab, where host Cade Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And remember to head over to brewlosophy.com to stay current on everything we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go.